Or I'm the co-chair. What? <laughs> they didn't miss much. Um, I'm the co-chair of uh, Fordham's Executive Advisory uh, Committee, along with Lou Miranda. Uh, we're so thrilled for all of you to be here, both virtually and in person. Um, we are particularly, I think, thrilled to have you here in person. This is a long time coming for not just the EAC, but all of the professionals in the Real Estate Institute. Uh, we're really quite proud of the subject matter that's been covered over these past two years. Um, and we've been itching to get in a room and, and really get to know uh, the leaders in the industry on hot button topics. Um, it's funny, I was thinking today, this is the first in-person event. This is the last time I was in an event like this in a room, not on Zoom, uh, was February of 2020. And there was less gray hair on my head. Um, there, <laughs> a lot was different in the world. I had one less kid. Um, and uh, it's, it, it struck me how quickly time flies. And uh, in the industry we find ourselves in, that's ever true uh, on some of these issues like rising interest rates. Um, so with, all, with that said, before I make a few intros, I want to first highlight uh, another milestone for Fordham today, uh, which is the uh, beginning of the, the Scholarship 250 Fund. Um, and the first awarding of a scholarship to a worthy student. Um, for those of you in the industry, I'm sure you all can attest to this. Uh, oftentimes we find ourselves or, or know of uh, uh, in, in the industry folks getting positions or, uh, or starting new roles based off who they know. Um, and the unfortunate truth of that is that it leaves a lot of talent on the outside looking in. Uh, and scholarship 250 is designed to combat that. It's designed to allow students who would otherwise not have an in in the real estate industry to uh, come to Fordham. And that could range from certificate courses to undergraduate degrees um, or advanced degrees and get the education and be the visionaries of tomorrow. Um, so we're really proud of that. We're really proud of that first scholarship. Um, and we're looking forward to uh, advancing it in the weeks and months ahead. And I would encourage you to check out Fordham's website uh, for more info on that program. And if you have the means, perhaps consider um, contributing to the fund and, and, and putting forward those next leaders of tomorrow. With that said, um, I'm gonna make a few introductions to, or at least one introduction to uh, some folks here. Before I get to that, I wanna thank the gold sponsors, um, Acor Capital, uh, Streamline, and McCarter English, uh, as well as our silver sponsors, which includes Land Services USA, uh, DDD, WW, LLP. Uh, and uh, with all that said, now I'm going to turn the floor over to, uh, oh, one last thing before Andy gets uh, <laughs> mad at me, but it, the questions, when you do have questions, please hold them both in person and virtually until after, and we'll go around uh, with a microphone and in the queue in Zoom and answer your questions one by one. That's enough for me. Um, now I want to ask Marty Gilligan to step on up. Thanks, Marty. I'm a little smaller than Ryan, as you can see. But uh, I want to thank everyone for coming here. It feels great to be in an in-person event. And thank you for everybody that's online as well. But. Um, this is, uh, you know, as Ryan said, it's been a while to get people in person. And I think, you know, I went to Fordham undergrad, spent some time at Lincoln Center, but this is the closest to the law school I got while I was here. So uh, this is a really great venue. I hope we do more events here. Uh, I work on the, e, the Real Estate Institute's uh, um, council. I'm charged with outreach and alumni. So I think Roger's here. I wanna say Roger. Roger's the president of the council now, and another member is here too. Um, so we just want everybody that's here, if we ask you to, if our students come to you and reach out to you, we'd like you just to take their conversation if you could. And, you know, you know, Fordham, you know, the motto is Fordham's their school, New York's their campus, you know, a lot of Fordham folks in, in the market. So I want to thank the panelists and uh, I appreciate everybody coming and I'll turn over to Lou. Again, welcome. I'm the outgoing um, chair, but I just like to thank everyone who's participating 
And I'm very grateful to our panel, um, Adam Doniger, uh, Cushman and Wakefield Vice Chair, uh, Andrea Bulkin, um, who actually runs the uh, finance funds for Brookfield, um, is a spectacular position there in which she's the head of. Um, we have Ryan Saravino, uh, who's the JLL chief economist, <clears throat> and uh, I appreciate him showing up. And lastly is uh, Tony Feynman, a good friend, and actually the second appearance he's made in the Visionary series, and we really do appreciate it. So enjoy it. Um, and again, thank you so very much for being here. Okay, so the panel's called rising interest rates and blah, blah, blah. So we're going to start. The first question is going to be it was very long. It was a very long name, sorry. Um, so we're going, to, we're going to start off with that question so Lou doesn't get mad at me when we talk about something else. Um, so in the last, in the, in the, whoa. In the last um, four months or so, it seems like the, the, you know, the, the not seems, the indices that, that we base our loans on and that the market bases hopefully cap rates, and we'll see if you believe that, but um, are, ha, have risen a couple hundred basis points. Spreads have risen somewhere between, in my mind, 75 and 150 basis points. So the cost of borrowing is, is you know, <coughs> interest rates are just much higher. I mean, the bottom line, everybody knows that, everybody sees that. So I'm going to just throw this question out kind of open ended and we'll see where that discussion takes us. But what is the impact that that's having on your business and on, you know, the, 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 the overall business in general. So start with you, Andrea. Okay. So what we're seeing, right. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. I can chat. <laughs> um, so what we're seeing right now is a market that's really very much in flux. Um, rising interest rates, I mean, on deals we quoted, you know, four months ago, where the borrower finally signed it up two months ago, and we're now getting ready to go to committee, well, what we're finding is, you know, the loan doesn't cover debt service anymore, because interest rates are rising. So we have, I've been at Brookfield 20 years, we've prided ourselves, you know, on never retrading, we honor, you know, our deals. But we've never been in this rising interest rate environment or drastically rising interest rate environment where we look at a deal and, you know, the day you are looking to go to committee, it doesn't cover when it covered the day you quoted it. So it is forcing us to go back to borrowers and say, guess what, we're going to have to lower proceeds, we may have to um, change our rates. Why do we have to change our rates? Well, the senior lenders, the banks, the first mortgages have really just gone, stepped out of the market whether that's because of rising rates, whether it's because of loan reserve issues, whether it's because of the Fed, I don't know. But the banks have said, you know what? We're gonna be on hold for the rest of the year, for the rest of the summer. Um, our mortgage rate competitors have said, we're on hold because we need to wait and see if the bank's margin call us. So there's a lot in flux right now, and we are still active, we are still lending, um, but we're having to look at every deal with a new lens look at the forward curve and say, this loan has to cover its debt service at the forward curve. So it is resulting in our changing terms on deals, which honestly we haven't done in the 20 years I've been there. Hi everyone, Adam Doniger. I'm at Cushman Wakefield on the investment sales side. So selling assets on behalf of institutional and private owners, uh, predominantly in New York, but really around the country and around the globe. Um, and thank you, Lou, for, for having me, inviting me. And I used to work for Andrea, so what she just said is factual. She has never <laughs> changed, <laughs> changed terms on anyone when, when I was there, and Brookfield has a terrific reputation. Um, so, I, you know, I, I have a different, a, a different um, overall view in the market in that what we have seen over the last couple of months has been unprecedented uh, in terms of transaction volume just falling off of a cliff. And you really have to segment it by asset class. So we all know the challenges with New York City office right now. This panel is not around New York City office and whether or not people are going to actually get back to work and what investor interest is for office buildings. Later question, Adam. Can you please? Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Um, but, you know, if you break it down by asset class, the office business, which has been, you know, the number one seller or, you know, asset class du jour over the last 20 odd years in New York City has really slowed down significantly. And all the office trades that were in the market have been put on pause and the debt is fueling the equity. So obviously when financing stops, equity is going to stop uh, alongside it. However, I would tell you that multifamily is still on a tear. And we all know in this, in this room, if you're looking to rent an apartment in New York right now, it's extremely challenging. The fundamentals have never been stronger. So the multifamily lending business, specifically the agencies, are still lending and are still quoting. 
And those rates right now are in the four to four and a quarter percent range at roughly 65% LTV ratio. So we are having a lot of success pivoting uh, and selling multi. We've always sold a lot of multi, but right now um, I make a living and I'm paid on commission. So if I'm selling an office building, that's lights out for me. But multifamily uh, is where we've spent a lot of our time over the last couple of months and what, what, I, what I see happening over the next couple of years. Um, and then you have, you know, the industrial sector, which has been very strong, the hospitality sector, which has its own challenges with a lot of supply in New York. But like I said, the debt is fuel the equity. When all the volatility happened in the market, I think it was March, April, uh, we saw about $12 billion of transaction volume just, it just stop. So for our business, uh, it was kind of a resetting and we said, okay, well, how do we pivot and how do we focus on ways to make money for, for our firm? And a big pickup has been in the multifamily space. So I don't want this to be extremely negative. There are still areas that are thriving. Uh, and I think one of those segments is, is the multi-space. So before, wait, hold on. But before you respond, right, so I'm going to say this a little more, a little more bluntly in, in my mind. So um, I interest rates are it, somewhere in the neighborhood of two times what they were six months ago. Bottom line, when we, when, when we, when we make, so I, I, I use this as an example all the time. It, I'm saying six months, it might only be four months, but let's say six months ago, there was a ton of multifamily, value add multifamily deals that were coming in the door to our shop and your shop and every other shop. 75% um, leverage and, and, and plenty of competition at the SOFR library, whatever it was, 275 range, 250 to 275 range. Okay, we were losing deals left and right there. Um, today, that same deal, so SOFR was at 10 or 12, right? Today, that same deal, is probably five or 10 points less leverage. There's less competition, which, you know, supply demand dynamics would suggest that. And the index is out over 200 basis points and the spread in my mind, I can do that deal at 400 to 425 over. Okay, so, so to me, that, that means that the cost of, of, of borrowing money is more than two times and it's not settled at more than two times. It's just sitting there at more than two times and, and with no, no real transparency or no real, um, um, no real ability to predict where it's going to settle, right? So to me, that means that at this moment in time, cap rates have have to widen. The, the value of assets has to has to drop at this point because it just costs too much. I mean, it just costs way too much. And as you pointed out, it happened too fast. What do you think about that? <laughs> well, first of all, thanks everyone uh, for having me. Uh, I I like to tell everybody that I'm the nerdiest person at JLL, if not the entire industry. So I'm just putting uh, that out there. Um, I would also say that I have very strong opinions on this. And uh, even internally, you will definitely get different views. But I am willing to die on the small hill that there's not a one-to-one -one relationship between interest rates and cap rates. There are too many other things that impact the value of buildings and the performance of assets. And if you look back just over the last two years, you could see that. Ten-year treasuries have gapped out, call it 200 to 250 basis points since they bottomed out two years ago. Cap rates probably are up a little bit. We're still getting the data on, on a little bit of a lag, and there's a... Sorry, I'm going to sound like a professor for a minute. There's a bit of a selection bias problem that's going on right now because what's the cap rate for a property that doesn't trade if you have to kind of model estimate Higher. it? But <laughs> it does seem like there is upward pressure on cap rates and downward pressure on pricing. Not so much in terms of outright price declines, but even if you look at an index like NACREF, which is very institutional, you have seen significant deceleration in returns and appreciation. So I... I and that's not to say that, that you won't see higher interest rates have some fallout in the industry, but I, I've been trying for at least the last 15 years to convince people that it's not a one-to-one -one translation. And I feel like more people are understanding that message, but I still will encounter people who sometimes say, well, if interest rates go up, cap rates have to go up. And I say, well, not exactly. So I think what we've seen to the point that has been made by multiple people, the pace of change has been so dramatic over the last six months that a lot of people are just trying to wrap their minds around what this means. Um, I, I, I don't often date myself, but I've been around the block more times than I usually admit. And I say that because in my career, I've never seen things change faster than they have in the last six months, both from a macroeconomic point of view and how that has spilled over into the markets. And I would say from, from our business, 
I, it, I don't see a lot of investors hitting the panic button, but I would say a lot of them are trying to grapple with how fast things have changed and the uncertainty associated with that. So they're taking a little more time, they're sharpening their pencils, they're doing more homework. And I think they're waiting, they're taking a beat and waiting to see what the next quarter or two looks like because we are in somewhat uncharted waters. As I said to a few people before the panel started, there's no good pithy expression to describe the world that we now find ourselves in after 30 plus years of globalization, 10 years removed from the first balance sheet recession since the Great Depression in the 1930s, the first real global pandemic in 100 years, the first major war in Europe since the end of World War II. There, you, you tie that together in an environment where economic growth is slowing down, yet we're still creating three to 400,000 jobs per month and consumer spending is the highest that we've ever seen. And there's not a good way to summarize what that world looks like. So if some uber geek like me is, is trying to figure out exactly what that means, I'm not surprised that a lot of the industry is taking a beat and trying to assess this. And so that is where I think you're seeing it come through in some of the capital markets data and some of the volume data and some of the pricing data. I just think there is just this predominance of uncertainty and uncertainty, unfortunately, is a very paralyzing force in both the real estate markets and the broader economy. Ryan, I think what I would add to that to your, in support of your point on cap rates, there is a massive bifurcation, and I know you see it, between high quality assets and average assets. And that's where you're seeing on the really high quality assets and you know, like speaking as Brookfield, if you look at our class A plus office, we're seeing record leasing at, you know, rates, leasing rates that are above pre pandemic levels. You're also going to see that on trophy multifamilies and on almost every trophy asset on retail, you're actually seeing leasing improve on retail for the first time um, ever. So it is, you know, a have and have not and the cap rate compression or sorry, the cap rate widening isn't happening on the class a a plus assets the way it is but are they, tra but are they trading really yes so. they are no so so, so so you're saying so 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 the class a office asset trades at what cap rate today okay good question um so <laughs> I, so so I think it, it, it's it's highly dependent on what that rent roll looks like so i'm going to take a deal that we sold for Brookfield right before all the volatility in the market. Um, this is one Manhattan West. I think most people know it, brand new tower that Brookfield constructed. It's a 2.3 million square foot building. The whole building, the average rent is about $87 a foot, okay? Two Manhattan West is going up right now and the average rent there is about $140 a square foot. So that's a severe mark to market story that could be told to investors. And there was a tremendous amount of demand to buy a building like that. Now, it also helped that it had in-place debt at 3.8% long-term. So that the debt story was put to bed. If you went out in the market today, today, okay, and had to get CMBS debt for that deal, I don't think it's available today, this moment. And you guys correct me if, if I'm wrong, but in a couple months from now, once, you know, once we start the, the, the turn of 2023, presumably the market is gonna rebound somewhat for class a buildings such as a one manhattan west there will be debt available it may cost a little bit more and that cap rate may not be a 3.8 percent cap rate because that was the cap rate on an in place um but it may be a little bit higher today is that a four and a half four and a quarter four seven five not smart enough to say but i'll give you another example we just sold a building downtown but, but hold on i was talking so so but but what you're what you're saying is that at this moment in time you bet that the cap rate even for that that class a asset has risen and i'm not and i'm yes. and you're talking about the cap rate based on the stabilized cash flow you know to me like you're not the 87 dollars to or i think you said 87 87 dollars 140 that that's not you know correct that i'm looking at some, the in place cap rate at 87 dollars a foot for the average rent. What's, what is the cap rate for, for someone that's buying a stabilized property at 140 bucks a foot? I think it's probably closer to a four and a half today, four seven. And you think it was 75 basis points or something tight? I'm, I'm not, I'm not holding it to you. It's market because that's gonna be a CMBS the, execution. I think we all, we, we all believe, obviously at varying levels, and we also all want to believe that, that, this, that, that this is not the end of the world, which it's not the end of the world, right? But, but, but to me, I'm, I'm trying to distinguish between what we think is going to happen in the future, which we'll talk about, and where things are right now, which is why I was, that's why I was asked. That's why I was, I was asking that question. There has definitely been, definitely been increasing in cap rates over the last, call it six months. And we're trading assets around the country. This is not just New York specific, 
all the growth markets, Austin, Nashville, South Florida, you name it. There has been an increase in cap rates and the data is a little bit slower to support it. We've seen it for the last couple of months, but there has definitely been an increase in cap rates to answer your question. And also what you see right this minute oh, sorry. is sorry, is a lot of people are taking the summer off, right? There's a, there's a view that deals will be better. I can get a better opportunity in three months than I can get today. I mean, most of our competitors basically yeah. believe there's no rush to do a deal right now. Let me see where the markets settle in three day, three months. I don't want to look stupid by jumping into something today. And there's also just, it's getting to be August and everybody's like, you know what? It's been a long couple of years. I mean, I've talked to our competitors at you know all the mortgage rates and they're like, yeah, call me in September. Um, no one has given that message to us at Brookfield, <laughs> which is unfortunate, but people are just saying, there's nothing to do right now. It, it, let's wait and see where things settle out, which is different. I mean, if you guys remember like 08, like when it, the market started to move, people were still kind of jumping in. It then kind of stopped in like 09. Remember we had yeah. capital in 10 and saying, why will nobody take our money? Because no deals were happening. Right. This was like, that all happened in like two months, I feel like. So there, there's definitely been a pause. However, there's still a lot that's happening. So we just were involved in a large transaction. Um, Sheldon Solo just sold a residential portfolio for $1.75 billion, okay? Like my closest friend is the buyer of that portfolio. He took a view that it's all market rate apartments and we believe in the mark to market story. The in-place rent across that multifamily portfolio is $75 a foot. They felt that the market should be $100 a foot for those buildings because they were not worked the way that they should have been. So that's a $1.75 billion deal. This afternoon, I have, a, I have a presentation on a $4 billion multifamily portfolio in New York City and the suburbs. So that is a deal where those types of deals are still happening. So there definitely has been this pause mentality and people are being very selective. Every conversation I have, yeah, we're being selective. I'm like, okay, next. But at the end of the day, there are deals that are happening. It's just slower volume for sure. And you'll see that in the data that's supported probably in Q3, right? Because I, I just saw the Q2 numbers from, from our uh, research team at Cushman. And there's definitely been a slowdown from Q1 because Q1 is a very, strong, um, a very strong quarter. And I'm talking about sales velocity and volume but you'll see it reflected in Q3 and Q4. Yeah, and I think that that dovetails with the way that I'm looking at the world, that there has been this dislocation because of what's happened. And again, I'm not saying that cap rates can't go up, but what, what's interesting to me about this is if you look historically at the data, it, you generally tend to only see cap rates going up during some kind of economic trouble. And, and I'm hesitating to use the R word specifically, not just because there's enough scaremongering about that these days. I, I, I'm not in that camp and I don't want to contribute to it. But it also comes back to the idea, and I don't mean to turn this into a semantic conversation, but the definition is, is different depending upon sort of how the layperson defines the R word and how the NBER, who is the ultimate arbiter, defines what it constitutes. And I emphasize that because Models and markets don't explicitly go by what the NBER says. So if markets and models are looking at a slowdown, the way that I think that certainly in the macro economy that we're, we're seeing it, I think it's being reflected in the data, then from that point of view, it might technically constitute the same kind of environment that in the past has put upward pressure on cap rates. It, it, was it March? So what's that, three months ago, four months ago, I wrote something about this and I basically said, the highest probability environment that we get an expansion in cap rates is the dreaded R word. Again, this is a little bit of a semantic argument, but, and I don't know what the data is going to show on third. I don't have any inside information on what the GDP data is going to say on Thursday or anything, but there was a technical contraction in the first quarter, even though that was more of an accounting thing. If there's not a contraction in the second quarter, there is almost certainly going to be an abrupt slowdown. Whether or not that technically, I'm just going to say it, whether or not that technically constitutes a recession almost doesn't matter if the end product from the economy's point of view and the market's point of view feels the same way, then that is a similar environment to ones in the past where we have actually witnessed cap rate expansions in the 1980s and the early 1990s, not really in the early 2000s, but 2008, 2009. If you look back over the last 43-ish years of what I call the, you know, the, the era of really decent commercial real estate data, that's generally what you see. So even if we don't, if, even if the NBER doesn't come out and, and officially declare that we're, we're in a recession, 
from the market's point of view, as long as there's enough of a slowdown in the economy, it might not matter. And we might end up with the same environment that has put upward pressure on cap rates over the last 40 years. So that's where I think this conversation gets interesting. Again, I don't want it to be a semantic conversation, but the question of whether or not cap rates are going up becomes more interesting if the environment, to your point about the future, right. looks more like those historical environments where we've also seen cap rate expansion, whether or not it's a technical recession or not. I think it's a, it's a very fair point. I was going to make a joke about the fact that whether we're in a recession or not, because it seems like the definition keeps changing, but it doesn't really matter. The point is, the point is that I think it would be it would be impossible to say that we're not in some, whether it's a short period or long period, period of economic slowdown. Right. There's, there's some impossible. slowdown going on. I mean, we, we all see it. I mean, there's fewer deals. It costs more money to borrow money. People are, you know, more cautious, whatever. There's, but there's obviously still transactions going on. And I think, you know, we, we are hopeful that that will continue to be the place because being frozen is not the best place to be for any of us, right? So um, I was trying to think about which direction to go from this because I, I so I, I think what I, wanted, what I want to talk about is a little bit because, because of what you just said. So let's, let's talk about the multifamily Let's shift to multifamily a little bit, because because what from from and I'm, this is this is a little bit facetious, but from what I've seen over the last two years, there's only like two or three markets in the country where rents have not risen by fifteen or twenty percent. Okay, um, and I and I I really mean that. I mean every every deal that comes in, when you look at the actual data on the ground, the rents are, have grown astronomically, right? And so one of the reasons why there might not why cap rates might not continue to or might not rise is because there's going to be growth in their rental income so you can you know offset the interest rate rise right so how is that possible that 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 residential rents or you know i i guess i'm really asking everybody their opinion where do you think the residential market is going how is it possible that residential rents will continue to rise precipitously and 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 is there an affordability issue we'll start start with you Yes, there's an affordability. I, I know. Issue. By the way, I understand that that was a very, very broad. No, question. no, no, no. no. I, 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 so pick however you want to answer it. Um, there certainly is an affordability issue with housing in the United States, and that I think dovetails with with sort of I think the crux of your question, which is we do not build enough housing in the United States. You know, estimates of how undersupplied we are will vary depending upon whose model you look at and who you discuss this with. But I'm I'm a big believer in in that you know. Markets tell you a lot, even if they're not perfectly efficient. Prices of housing wouldn't be rising, and I mean for rent and for sale housing, would not be rising the way that, that they are if we didn't have some kind of supply demand dynamic imbalance in the United States. And again, estimates will vary how many millions of units were undersupplied, but if you look at the growth in housing over the last let's call it the last 13 years since, since we came out of the, the prior recession to where we are today, we are just not developing enough housing relative to underlying demographic change, relative to the increase in the number of households in the United States, relative to the, the increase in the population in the United States. And I just look at that and I think demand for housing is going up based on demographics, supply is not keeping pace, you know, I, not everybody is in, you know, economics geek like me, but it's kind of econ 101. If demand is growing faster than supply, then the equilibrium price in the economy has, in that market has to rise. And that's really what we've seen. And if anything, the financial crisis really exacerbated this because housing was at the epicenter of that. And it was temporarily overbuilt for a while. And then lending standards tightened. We kind of pulled the plug on that. At the same time, we were going through a massive demographic change where millions of millennials poured okay, so demand so, 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 into the market. So we, don't have, we don't have enough houses. We don't have enough apartments. But we also have this rising interest rate environment that we're talking about that we're not going to predict is going to, is going to dissipate. You know, we're not going to, I'm assuming we're not about going to predict when it's going to dissipate. So how how can I, I mean do you do you see I'm asking you um, do you do you see any is there any pullback in the in in the in the investor community in multifamily is there any concern that in, that, that rent rents cannot continue to rise to offset rising interest rates yes no <laughs> so we we we, we are we're, we are already experiencing a pullback in a lot of these major markets okay I, I alluded to nashville austin and south florida so let's just pick on those three okay those have been the hottest markets maybe in the world over the last call it five to ten years there has already been a slowdown in rental rate growth or the trade outs as real estate professionals call them okay so with the trade outs not being at 20 percent a year being more like 10 to 12% a year, let's just use that because all these markets are different, you are inevitably seeing a pullback from the renter, okay? Now, I, another question this begs is if home prices 
come down because interest rates go up, are more people going to be renting? We believe yes, and this is part of the reason why we're spending so much time in the multifamily space. But we are seeing investor pullback big time. Okay, our partners in South Florida, and we do a lot of in South, a lot of multifamily sales in South Florida. We have said, let's just take the next couple of months off. Let's get these deals done that we're working on, and let's come to the market in the fall. Because right now, there's just not the investor interest that there was to buy these deals. So we are seeing a big, big pullback, both in the trade outs and investor interest to buy multifamily to answer your question. And how, what are you, are you seeing in your business? We're, we're seeing the same thing. We're seeing um, universally buyers go back to sellers and asking for a price reduction in order to buy. And that ranges from 5% to 20%. And that depends on the asset class. If you're a BC multi, you're going to get hit with a 20% hit to your price. If you're an A, you know, maybe it's a token 5%. So it's it's like like everything else, it's just dependent on the quality of the asset. But you know, 1975 to 1985 multis, given who they're serving demographically, they cannot keep raising rates because their clientele just can't pay those higher rates. So we are seeing pullback on on deals, and we're seeing deals go away because sellers aren't capitulating to the prices that the buyers want. So the, the other question that you asked is about affordable housing. So where we are having a, a ton of I'm really of asking about the affordability of housing in general <laughs> it, okay. versus, versus, the, versus the, the, the label of affordable housing. Just, just, I mean, answer whichever one you want, but that's what I, that's what I was referring to. <laughs> Got it. What I was going to say is that one area in the country that we've seen a ton of transaction volume is in the affordable housing space. Right. There has been a lot of money raised for affordable housing. Goldman Sachs has what they call their urban investment fund. AEW has what they call their essential housing fund. Uh, Morgan Stanley has a vehicle. Everybody seems to have a vehicle to buy affordable housing and it checks the ESG bucket. So we are doing a ton around the country. We're doing a billion and a half dollar portfolio right now. We took bids last week on a $400 million deal called Savoy Park. So there's a lot of affordable housing that will trade coming out of this. And I want you to talk a little about the affordability of housing, or just in general, because no, I, I, I don't understand how we can continue. I, I, well, we can't, so I, I think what, what I was saying and what, and what the other panelists are saying, like, the, it's not mutually exclusive. We can be in a structurally undersupplied housing situation, but not be able to sustain rent growth at the levels. That, I, I mean, I look at the data. I don't think the data is wrong, but I just look at the rent growth that we've seen over the last 12 to 18 months and think, I, that's got to be a mathematical mistake. It just seems so incongruous with the environment that's around us. It but it seems like it's, grant is growing in, in Houston. Just but, it, but it's that was the one. But, <laughs> but it's it, 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 it's remarkable to me that that I, I, I sort of know why it's the case. But you just look superficially at those rent levels, and then you look at the historical time series data and think, how was this possible? It's because we lived through a very unique period, but we can still be structurally undersupplied on housing and still see. You know, rent growth decelerating, right? That's not a mutually exclusive environment. No I don't think there was any way that the rent growth we've seen the last 12 to 18 months was remotely sustainable, especially as the economy is slowing down, fiscal stimulus is fading. But we can still end up in a place where even if rent growth slows to something more normal, whatever that word means these days, that we can still be structurally undersupplied on housing, I, which we is are, why so there's no affordability question. issue, which is why affordable housing is such a such a hot commodity these days, because there is a massive affordability problem in the United States. And it doesn't help when New York City takes away 421A. So part of the part of the concern <laughs> here is is political as well. And so, you know, New York City, we are totally undersupplied with housing, as we all know, and it's a major problem. So anything that is market rate that doesn't have affordability is trading at a premium. I think Andrea alluded to it earlier, but if there's a class A building that's in the market, it will garner very attractive pricing because there's only so many of those buildings that are going to trade. It's good that New York is under supply because now we're going to talk about all the office buildings in New York City that are empty. <laughs> um, so t t what do you just, just why don't you just open up with tell me generally what you're seeing? I mean, I know you did a little bit, but be, expand upon what you're what, what, what you're seeing. So specifically to that question, I mean, you know, I, I to New York and, and outside of New York as well. So. OK, let, well, let, let's focus on New York. So um, and and just to make sure I understand the question, there's a lot of office buildings in New York that there's 500 million feet in New York. Right. And Ryan can give you the stats better than I can. But there's 500 million feet in New York. There's probably 350 million of those square feet that probably don't need to exist. Maybe that's aggressive. Did but, it not need to exist before? It doesn't need to exist in the new world that we live in. Um, probably the new world. 
Okay. So, so the office environment is likely going to change. So what happens to all these office buildings that I'll call pedestrian office buildings that really don't really have a home, not great credit, not great weighted average lease term. Um, I had sold a lot of these buildings or we had sold a lot of these buildings over the last couple of years. And the thesis was, you know, creative office, you're going to get a tech tenant, a Tammy tenant. That's great until they go out of business and they forget to pay the rent. So, so a lot of these buildings, the tenants forgot to show up. So what happens to those buildings? There has been a big push to convert a lot of those buildings to residential, but you can't do it as in the current state because there's no tax structure from New York City. So your taxes will eat away at your cash flow and it just is not going to make economic sense. So we at Cushman, our team, we're, we're big proponents of the city getting involved here and we've heard, and I don't know if we have any, um, any political folks in the room, but we've heard that New York City is trying to make a push for this. Um, there has been one name that has been doing a lot of these office to residential conversions. His name is Nathan Berman. Um, now there's a handful of groups that are focusing on that. So if there's anybody young in the audience that is becoming a developer, that's probably an area to focus on because there's a lot of square footage that we think is going to be converted to maybe another use. Maybe, maybe it's residential, maybe it's storage, who knows. Um, and then nationally, I mean, the office business has slowed down significantly. You know, there's still there's still top tier trades in those markets that have great growth, but the, the the overall market for office is going to change, in my view, forever. Uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's just going to evolve as we evolve as a as a community. What where is what what does it look like around the rest of the country? Um, it it really depends on you know where the better buildings are versus where the more pedestrian buildings are. So, you know. Places like California, the west side of LA is still extremely strong. Um, Austin, Nashville, South Florida, parts of Texas, Salt Lake City has been a great growth market. Raleigh, Durham has been a great market. Um, it's just, it's really location specific and looking at the demos in those respective submarkets. And then I think, you know, you add to that, you know, there have been shifts over the years, but you know, the area that seems to be struggling the most is the Pacific Northwest, right? And I'm going to include San Francisco in that. You know, it was growing, it was booming, but now you have a combination of tech companies being more willing to have people work from home, but also the political situation, the crime situation. So, you know, those were hot markets before, but Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, they're lagging. And it's not just, there's a variety. It's not just economics, it's, you know, economics, it's politics. And it's, you know, now some of that, may actually improve with a downturn because some of these companies may now say to their employees, guess what? So that's what I was, so so was going to ask you specifically. So, so both from the equity side and the debt side, to me, there, there, there's a bunch of factors um, that are, uh, besides just the broader economy, the things we're talking about from an economy standpoint, obviously the changes over the last two and a half years have been, have been like nothing we've ever seen in our careers, right? I mean, you know, as an ex you know, work, work from home is a is a is an interesting moniker, but but we we're also seeing, you know, we we've never had to look at tenants that want to stay in a building for a year and a half or two years, right? So big parts of leases. So, talk to me a little bit how you're looking at office underwriting today. Yeah, well, you know, oh, sorry. Um, one one of the interesting things that we're seeing though with the work from home and the hybrid model is we have so many people, a lot of our tenants are basically saying, we're going to allow our people to work from home one day a week, two days a week, but we want everybody in the office the same three days a week. So as an office landlord, that's great because you're not taking less space because you have, you're giving the flexibility, you know, you're not gonna see a lot of people in the city on Fridays, but everybody has to be in the office on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday for a lot of our tenants. And so I think that is actually, um, you know, helpful for the office markets. Um, look, we're in, if we're underwriting a new, we haven't underwritten a lot of office loans where we see a lot of tenants in for a year, year and a half. Um, I mean, we're just gonna, you know, underwrite it that they're rolling and you gotta have TIs and leasing commission reserves to put the tenant in. Do the deal, do, do deals make sense when you do that? I mean, or-, or, or you... we're, just, we're just including that in vacancy, yeah. right? I mean, that's just, that, that, that's not, you know, like any office deal you're looking at where, you know, leases are expiring quickly, you're just going to assume they're vacant. So we're, and, you know, I honestly, most of the office deals we're looking at, we're looking at, we're lending on office deals with a long weighted average lease term. You know, pre-COVID, yeah, we lent on office deals where there was value add and the, you know, tenants were rolling and you were going to get higher rents. Now, you know, show me a 12-year 
Walt, and I'm happy. To, to talk a little bit about what you think is, is, is happening across the country with the office market. What I think is interesting about the office market is, is we are really seeing this, um, I'll call it a, almost a barbell strategy. If you look at the demand for space relative to the distribution of inventory, it's very strong at the high end with, say, properties developed in the last seven years, relatively more leasing activity there than inventory. It's also relatively strong at the sort of the older end, th those really great vintage buildings, right? You know, the, the stereotype in, in, you know, Midtown South places like that with the exposed brick and the ductwork and things like that. In between those where it's commoditized, that's where you see relatively low demand for space relative to the inventory. And what I think is interesting about that is that obviously that constitutes most of the inventory. We are moving into, we were already in this world, but I think the pandemic has accelerated this where we are dealing with a very structural demographics based labor shortage. And why I find that interesting in the context of whatever office becomes on the other side of this is that if we are going to try downturn notwithstanding to, to get people to come back into the office, then employers are increasingly going to look at the office space as part of that, you know, attracting, retaining talent, not just compensation, not just benefits, not just flexibility, but what is the office space actually like? Is it conducive to actually coming in and being productive, a place that you feel like you want to come into, especially if you have to deal with a somewhat onerous commute? And that's very different from where we've been over the last 10 years. And I know it's it's hard to, to remember that on the you know prior to the pandemic, but the trend was, this whole open plan, have everybody sit at a cafeteria style table under brain melting fluorescent lamps. And if you think that is going to pull people back into an office in a structural labor shortage that is now being exacerbated by a pandemic and this work from home phenomenon, you are going to have trouble attracting and retaining talent. So to me, as an economist, I find that interesting because that is just a different way to impact that supply demand imbalance that we're going to be seeing in the labor markets over the next five, 10, 15, 20 years, because again, this is a structural demographics-based shortage. This is not a function of the pandemic predominantly. So I see office evolving and becoming a more important part of that overall package that employees and, and employers think about. Okay, I'm gonna shift topics for a second. So in, in, in my career, every time there's been an economic downturn, every money pours into places like New York and, and you know maybe DC, um, LA, places like that. Um, talk a little about what's different today and, 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 and what's happening in this economic downturn and where, where capital's flowing. Andrew. You know, we are still seeing uh, foreign capital going into, you know, gateway cities. Um, I mean, there is, you know, there is obviously, to Adam's point, there is capital that's been flowing into places like Austin, Nashville, a lot of capital flowing into South Florida. And I, you know, if I was guessing, I might guess that that's a permanent change, um, because historically, you never wanted to lend in South you Florida. Finally, see it that this yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some people have enjoyed it for years, um, but you know, so South Florida may be, you know, a structural change. Some of these other areas, you know, they're, they're starting to be challenged by the huge influx of people into places that were not necessarily like you see Nashville is. You know, having some issues with the huge number of people coming in to a place that wasn't really equipped to deal with it. But we're, we're still seeing capital flowing into gateway cities. Um, maybe not the San Francisco's, but we are still seeing capital looking for. Is there, is there, is there any change that you see in, the, in, 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 in this environment? Well, look, we're seeing capital. Hard to tell because this environment is, you know, 60, so 90 days yeah. old. Yeah. And, you know, capital is what we've seen since the pandemic is a lot of capital that has been flocking to name brand managers. Like we raised our debt fund. We had our final close in December of 2021. And, you know, we did our whole fundraise over Zoom or WebEx, which is what we use. Um, and, you know, it was very easy because we didn't have to travel anywhere. And investors wanted to go for the name brand, the safer alternative. Um, so, you know, that's what we've seen. We've seen ourselves raising a lot of capital in a lot of different areas. I mean, we're seeing a ton of capital flowing into infrastructure. Um, I've lost track of the numbers, but like our infrastructure equity fund and our infrastructure debt fund are raising record amounts of capital. So, 
right now this summer, while people are pausing in other areas, they are flooding into infrastructure. What, what, are, you, what are you seeing, Adam? Yeah, so I, I think I agree with a lot of what Andrew just said. San Francisco has been redlined by a lot of investors for obvious reasons. But if we take New York, for example, which is the city that we all love. Um, I like college... Boca Raton. <laughs> you were ahead of the curve. You were so ahead of the curve. You and my grandmother. <laughs> yeah, I'll Very move there good. when I'm 85. Now it's on video um, for Warren to see. I was perfect. <laughs> So, so, so New York, um, when kids graduate from college, where do they want to be? They want to be in New York. Okay. So we have, we have felt that over the last couple of years, not just from the residential statistics, but also the office statistics for better assets. If we think about, if I think about my business and where a lot of the capital has been flowing from, we have done three multifamily deals as of late in the last two months, all with Korean investors. Why is that? Korean investors, one, the cost to hedge today is a lot less expensive than it was a year ago. Um, we're also seeing a ton of European investors chasing New York because the Europeans are significantly concerned about the war in Ukraine and how that's going to impact them. So we are seeing groups like Commerce Real, which is a German group, get pretty bullish on New York City. We had sold them a building called 100 Pearl Street downtown, which is an office building, $850 million transaction. And they paid around a four and a half cap for that building. Eight, I think it was about $800 a square foot, roughly. And that was just before the downturn. Today, and, and they bought that cash, okay? Today, that deal probably prices within the same zip code because a lot of the European capital sources that we speak with are looking to get their money out of Europe right now. So the combination of European investors, Middle East less so, um, and I know this question wasn't about foreign capital, but I think it dovetails into the question that, that you asked. But New York City has been the beneficiary of everything happening globally. There are other markets like DC, which has been a very tough environment, especially in the office side. Um, so investors are not spending a ton of time in DC. Chicago historically has been one of those markets, but it's slowed down. LA, there's still a lot of activity. But out of the gateway cities, New York has seen probably the most robust investment dollars from the foreign from the foreign crowd over the last couple of months, and we think that that trend is going to continue. Yeah, and, and the reason I think we all keep focusing on foreign capital is because it is critically important right now. You know, given the war in Ukraine, given where interest rates are all over the world, we're seeing a lot of capital coming into the U.S. I mean, the U.S. as a safe haven is definitely a thesis that you know foreign investors are are following. Um, and, and, you know, to Adam's point, when we raised our latest debt fund, we had a lot more um, Asian investors than we ever have had before. I'm going to take a little different approach to this and say that I find this topic particularly interesting because when I look at our industry over multiple business cycles, what, what you see is something interesting. Consensus tends to be right in the short run, but then long in, in the wrong in the long run. And you only have to go back 10 years to see this. So go back about 10 years ago, if you can remember that far back after what's happened in the last few years, to 2012 and the narrative around where people were, were living and working in 2012, right? Remember the stereotypes that we all made, or not all of us, but some of us about millennials, right? Oh, they don't want to own anything, including houses and cars. They're going to live in urban areas, taking their bicycles and or public transportation to their green open plan offices where they were all going to hold hands and sing kumbaya and be really productive or something like that. And then because of that, everybody missed this millennial oh, like, exodus. You, <laughs> <laughs> then there's this millennial exodus that started before the pandemic out into the suburbs. And then it got accelerated because the pandemic did a really good job of pushing everybody who was on the fence off the fence. And then after that, I got whiplash from how quickly we went from young people and workers only want to be in these five cities to nobody wants to be here ever again. <laughs> so that's how I know neither of those narratives is true because like you did, there are underlying dynamics to places like New York and even San Francisco, which I know has gotten is, is really the, the poster child these days. It's coming in for a bit of a beating. But unless you think that all of the really great things that was supposed to be so attractive to people a decade ago somehow disappear, which again, I'm, I'm, I don't have a perfect crystal ball, but unless you think all the cool things that, that attract people to New York are going to disappear and the cool things that attract San Francisco to San Francisco are going to disappear, then there's no good sound reason to think that those markets will 
somehow just fade into oblivion. Will they go through disruption? Absolutely. But we've seen that over multiple decades in business cycles, even in New York, because for those of us who, those of you who are old enough to remember what the 70s and 80s were like when there was this employee exodus out of New York into the proliferation of suburban corporate campuses, which you could still find dotting the landscape, not just here, but other markets around the country, and then how that reversed and everybody came back in and only wanted to work in cities and out in the suburbs anymore. So I find there's always an underlying real dynamic to this, and I try not to get caught up in the short-term emotion of everybody wants to be here or nobody wants to be here, because that's almost never how this works in the medium to long run. So if you're an investor and you're really looking at the medium to long run, my advice is, don't get caught up in the new sexy shiny thing that everybody's chasing in the short run because it tends to not last in the medium to long run. The underlying supply demand dynamics, demographics, the economic structure, all that cool stuff to do, that's usually what wins out in the medium to long run, not chasing the hot dot around in the short run. I, I, so I, I think that that's right. And I think that the, you know, the, the, the positive sentiment towards New York and some of the gateway cities make, makes total sense to me. To me, there's been a shift, though, and and it's it and it's like I agree. Really, what you were saying is is for for folks that say New York's dead, that's ridiculous, right? Right. For 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 folks that say things there, that there haven't been some fundamental changes in the way that people live, work, play, and and invest, that's also kind of a sure. Thing. And those so, things are so, not mutually exclusive, right. right? So, so what I what I find interesting about, about these times, besides maybe the next thing that we'll talk about, which is a little bit ambitious, but we'll see if we can get it done, um, is, is that is that for the first time in my career, I mean, so I, I've lived down in South Florida for 20 years, right? I bought my house in 2008. I didn't want to buy it, but my wife said we had to have a permanent home, so we did. Um, that was funny. Um, and, uh, and it's been basically the same price the entire time we've lived there until this last year when it's now two and a half times what we paid, right? So to me, that's not sustainable. That's ridiculous. But but a lot of people moved from other places to South Florida, to, to Austin, to Nashville. And there's some infrastructure problems in some of these places, Salt Lake City to, you know, you know, um, um, you know, places in Arizona and and in and, and Colorado. I feel like I, I personally feel like that like the like the 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 broader market has discovered these places and they're it's not gonna go back to what it was before. I mean it it you're right. This whole concept that everyone's no one's gonna live in, in the city and everyone's moving into suburbs and no one's gonna live in the suburbs and move in the city, that's ridiculous. The concept of New York being dead is ridiculous. But the concept of of a major shift in in the fact that there are people that are permanently changing the way they live, work, and play. To me, that, that, that's, that's permanent. Sure. Well, and, and one of the things that's interesting, and this is anecdotal more than anything else, but so we were back in our office in June of 2020, so we've kind of watched what's been going on. And I will say, you know, months before everybody else started going back to their offices, the retail, the restaurants, the streets down around our office were packed. Yep. I mean, we would laugh when people, we, we'd read articles about, you know, no one's back in the office and we'd go down to PJ Clark's and people are like, you know, young people are like spilling out onto the sidewalk. You can't even, you know, everybody's afraid of COVID. They were working COVID. from home and then they were going to eat the hamburger at PJ Clark's. Exactly. That's the problem. <laughs> I mean, they're worried about COVID, but everybody's jammed into the, into the restaurant. Yeah. But, you know, in New York and then anecdotally, you would look at apartments and everybody wants to move and no one can find an apartment. And you have seen people like New York and Boston, we didn't talk about Boston, but Boston has seen a huge influx of people, you know, to go along with all the life science jobs. So that is a place I think that has probably permanently changed, become a little less stodgy, um, and has been a beneficiary of some negatives of some of the West Coast cities, despite. So, so that, that's actually a good, a, good, a good line. So we all agree New York did not leave the, leave the earth. Okay, so New York's going to be back. It's going to it's going to it's going to be in, in in some thriving state at some point, right? Maybe now, maybe future. What are the places that that What are the places where that's not the case? You know, you said Boston is is is, is you know Boston seems to be you know on on an upside. I'm asking you first. <laughs> what are the places where it's not? What are the cities that we traditionally have thought of as 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 being safe havens or you know it's always going to look like this that are not going to be like that way anymore? I guess, and this is kind of my personal view, not not necessarily Brookfield's view, but I look at the Pacific Northwest. Everything from San Francisco north, um, I'd worry about. What about Chicago? Chicago. Chicago. <laughs> I, 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 I was going to say Chicago. It's freezing cold. Um, <laughs> the market has struggled significantly for obvious reasons. There's all sorts of political issues. When Ken Griffin announces that he's moving his firm 
out of Chicago into South Florida. I think he was 1% of the taxpayer pace, <laughs> taxpayer pace. I mean, that, that's, personally. Personally. <laughs> that's, that, that's not a great sign for Chicago. I think Chicago uh, may struggle, but I, I think it's also going to be a little bit more focused on better weather states are going to be the beneficiary of everything that we're talking about. People graduate from college and you know what? It's not so bad living in, in Raleigh or living in, you know, parts of Arizona. So, um, you brought it up earlier. There's like two places where there's like no, you know, no rent growth that's double digit. I don't know. What are those places? Are they maybe? I don't know. I just made that up. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but it seemed dumb to say that every single city in America had double digit rent growth. So but, I just said there was two that there wasn't. <laughs> but there is, a, there, is a, well, there is a story for almost every place. I mean, Pittsburgh, which historically has been a pretty ugly city. No offense to anybody that's from Pittsburgh. I mean, there's a great story in Pittsburgh for certain segments. Um, so it's hard to pick the spots that are going to be the losers. There has been a good story to most of the markets in New York over the last, you know, run up. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out over maybe the next couple of years. It could be more challenging. Ryan, what do you think? Tell us where we should not invest our money. I think about this, <laughs> not surprisingly, a, a little bit differently because, and I think Pittsburgh, to, to, to Adam's point, Pittsburgh is a great example of this because if we were having this, I know this is going to sound ridiculous, like we need a flux capacitor, but if we were having this conversation in the, in the 60s and the 70s, the, the Detroits of the world were a much bigger part of the economy. The Pittsburghs of the world were a much bigger part of the economy. They had to go through a very serious structural change as the economy evolved, but neither of them completely disappeared. And there were other conflating factors. I don't, I don't want to discount those, but they had to get to a new equilibrium, wherever that is. And we knew as the economy changed that the Detroits and the Pittsburghs of the world were not going to be as important as, as they were once upon a time. Nowadays, it's the New York, so New York was always important, but you know, the tech markets, places like that, maybe it's shifting to the South a little bit. So the question in my mind isn't so much because I tend to agree, Chicago has some issues. Did, did Chicago implode or does San Francisco implode? The question is, where's that new equilibrium and what do you want to pay for that? Because people will still be in those places. Chicago, again, is a little bit different, but even in, in San Francisco, and I think one of the things that's getting conflated these days, and it's really happening in New York, is do people want to live somewhere versus do people want to go into a physical office? And those are not exactly the same thing. And Andrew made a great point about this. The way I think about it is the fun economy is back. The office economy is not back, but the fun economy is back. So when I think about where San Francisco is going, where I think about Chicago is going, they will settle into some new equilibrium. It's Maybe it's lower than where it's been historically, but it's not zero. And there will still be opportunities there, even if they're not as abundant as they were you know, two, three decades ago. Because unless you think that the most important technology market in the country, and maybe the world, is going to implode to zero, then there's still a compelling reason to pay attention to what goes on from San Francisco down the peninsula to Silicon Valley, even if you don't have the abundance of opportunity that you would have had 20 or 30 years ago. I was just going to say, and, and to your point, any place that has great educational institutions, right. and I would add to that great medical institutions, will always be a, and look, that's one of the things that has brought Pittsburgh back, yep. right, is the University of Pittsburgh and all the stuff they've done. So that's where, you know, the San Francisco's of the world, you know, with all of the education and all of the medical and all of the tech will come back. That's kind of the hope Chicago has. It has a lot of those great institutions that are graduating well-educated people that are needed in all of these jobs. Yeah, and if you think about where the economy, I, I don't have a perfect crystal ball, but that's a great point, because if you think about where the economy is going over the next 20 to 30 years, I'm willing to bet that healthcare is a bigger part of the economy over time, that education is a bigger part of the economy over time. If you have those as anchors, again, you, Pittsburgh's not what it once was, but it's held up because of the educational institutions and, and, and the medical institutions. Even Detroit, to a certain extent, has not faded away completely. It's really hard to sit here and argue that if you're talking about someplace like the Bay Area, where they have all of the, the technology infrastructure that now exists, and Stanford and Berkeley and a whole bunch of other really good places, I, again, I don't know where that new equilibrium is, but I'm not betting against that in the medium to long run and an economy that's going to become more healthcare and education oriented. No way. I, I, to me, it's, I, I, it's not really been against it. This, this will lead to my very ambitious last question. We'll see if it actually works. But the, 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 it, it, it's not the fact that, that it's, it's going away in my mind, but, but there's other, there's other um, 
ecosystems in multiple places around the country that are technology groups that didn't exist 10, 15 years ago, right? And to me, that's what's changing is that, you know, we just, somebody said something before about, and I, and I heard this a couple of years ago, that, 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 and I think it was you referring to this, is that um, it used to be that, that, that um, you know, kids graduated from college and they looked for a job, they got a job, then they moved to the city and then they decided that, and, and they found a place to live. Now, or at least a couple of years ago, the big, you know, the thing I heard at every conference was that it's changing, the world changing. Now what happens is kids graduate from college and they say, I want to live over there. They go there, they find a place to live, and then they go see if they can find a job, right? To me, there's more places for those, those, those kids to go now. I mean, because you can go to Austin. It's a pretty robust technology, you know, community. I mean, there's other places in our country. So, so here, here's, here's my question. Um, and this is really open-ended. You can answer it any way you want, or you can ignore it, and I'll just go to another boring question. Um, <laughs> So I, 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 you know, I've been doing this for a long time. We've all been doing this for a long time. And, and I feel like we, we talked about some negative things like, you know, inflation is historic, interest rates are rising so fast, you know, cap rates are rising, whether we believe it or not. But um, to me, this is the most interesting time in my career, personally. I think there's going to be tremendous opportunities, but there's so many socioeconomic changes where people live and work, et cetera, et cetera. So talk to me a little bit about what, you know, the, the things that you think are going to be most impactful over the next five, you know, 10 years in our business and the things that we haven't looked at in the past that we're going to be looking at going forward. How is that for an open-ended question? <laughs> What's for lunch? What's for lunch? <laughs> um, so first of all, great, great question. Um, I'm sure a lot of people think about, you know, these, these factors every day. Um, I think I'm going to run with what Andrea said, the medical institutions and the education institutions have really set some of these cities on fire. Um, and a place like Boston, where Boston has been more of a financial center over the last couple of years, or historically, the last few years have been all about life science, life science, life science. So every one of our clients has, or most of our clients that are in the office businesses have pivoted into the life science space and they've all made a home for themselves some way, somehow. And you could sprinkle a little, you know, little uh, lab dust on a deal, and then all of a sudden it's a four cap from a five. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, so you could have like one life science tenant, even though the building may not be equipped, may not have 13 foot ceilings, maybe with floor load capacity, may not be equipped to handle life science type tenants. But that, that industry in particular, we think has a tremendous amount of room and it all ties into cities that have the medical and have the education. So I don't know if that's just one answer. I mean, we can go on and I could talk for the next hour, but I'll pass it on to somebody so else. So wait, just so you know, um, the life dust, we are seeing through it. We, we all do believe in the, in, the, in the life science space, but that little life dust, sometimes you're spraying like, oh, that office building doesn't work. We'll just call it a life science building and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> We, we, we did that a lot. Until I Mark know. Just, <laughs> yeah, I, look, I think for our business, you know, on the lending side, you know, we've always focused on quality of sponsorship, quality of assets, all of that's important. But, you know, we will be focusing on high quality class A type of assets. In an uncertain world, we think there's still great opportunities and we're going to continue to lend and invest but we're going to be focused on, you know, high quality assets that are going to trade below intrinsic value because other people are sitting on the sidelines. I would say we are dealing with a global structural labor shortage because of massive demographic change. And it was going underappreciated in the decade leading up to the pandemic. And then I think the pandemic really opened everyone's eyes to it, but it's not just in the United States. It's in the United Kingdom, it's in continental Europe, it's in Japan, it's in China, it's in South Korea, it's in a lot of other places that, that I probably can't even list. That is a pretty durable feature. We have gone through an era with the baby boom where we've had an abundance of labor relative to the demand that's out there. As that starts to change, and we're really going through that, that has massive ramifications, not just for the overall economy, but to some of the larger questions that we've had, where people want to work, where do they want to live, what kind of industries that they want to be in. We are only scratching the surface of this because we were just starting to see this baby boomer exodus out of the workforce with the birth rate structurally declining and not a political statement, but immigration has become a political football in a way that it wasn't once upon a time. We don't have a panacea to fix this in the short to medium run. It is going to get objectively interesting in the economy and the real estate markets over the next 10, 15, 20 years as we go from an era of labor abundance to labor scarcity. I 
factory. To me, the, the, the interesting thing is like when we get past the fact that, I mean, eventually we'll settle into where cap rates are, where interest rates are and where, you know, where the world is, is transacting, you know, more frequently than, than I think it's transacting today. But we're, we're going to be dealing with these types of issues. It's, it's, it's like where, where people live, work, play, and where they want to live, work, play, and how they do it is just something that we really haven't dealt with in our careers in a long time. So I, I'm supposed to open up for questions, you said? Okay, I'm opening up for questions. Oh. <laughs> Start in the room if anyone has any questions. No, just questions, no comments. <laughs> <laughs> well, my comments are meant to be provocative and to uh, open the minds of both the panelists and the audience. So these are some thoughts that have crossed my mind. Two main ones, apropos of uh, Ryan's thoughts about the office becoming more inviting. I think the office has to become what I'm terming the BMO, the big mama office, daycare, schooling, extended hours, health care, health clubs. If we want to get workers back in the office. We have to look at the needs that the workers have. And the office now has to satisfy those needs. That's the first comment, question, and so on. Second one is even bigger in its view. Affordable housing, truly affordable housing. We need somebody in the real estate industry, deep pockets, deep societal respect and consciousness and understanding to say, look, our company is going to step forth. We're going to look for real estate that's undervalued. We're going to build something like Co-op City, Peter Cooper Village, and create truly affordable lifetime housing for American workers, because it's not happening. And America can't happen without that. Thoughts? One Thank of you. the practical challenges you have is, especially in an inflationary environment, it's the cost to build buildings. So if you're in New York, even if the land is free, the cost to construct housing that's you know safe and ESG friendly um, is so high that it's prohibitive to build affordable housing without government involvement in a densely populated urban area where you know just construction costs are astronomical, especially now with you know supply chain and labor shortages. So it needs to be a public-private partnership to make that work. Well said. Question over here. Yeah, I'll give it a swing here. Um, so over the past couple of years, we've seen some political municipalities, St. Paul, Minnesota, Oregon, California, pass some sort of rent control. St. Paul's is particularly idiotic, but that's, I'm sure you guys will talk about that. Um, and following that, we saw a flow of capital to red states, anywhere from the Carolinas to Tennessee, Texas. I'm from Boca Raton, so shout out Florida. There you go, Tony. Um, is this something that we're seeing? <laughs> Bring down the average age by like 17 years. <laughs> um, specifically on the SFR, BTR, multifamily space, is this something that we're continuing to see here, or is that just kind of a, sh a short term blip? So w when you say here, you're talking about New York, or you're talking about nationally? Uh, I'm talking about nationally, capital flowing down to the smile states, and for some reason, Colorado, which is very well run, even though it's a Democratic governor, uh, but just continue out of capital going down to particularly uh, no, no state income tax states, uh, red states in the South. Let's hope not. Um, but New York in particular, because uh, we could focus on different geographies, and I can't speak to every one of those geographies, but New York, that has been in the cards for the last 15 years. Every time we try to sell something, there are always investors that say to us, well, there's potential universal rent control. Look at what happened in St. Paul. Look at what happened in Oregon. Okay, For every investor that tells us that, there's 20 other investors that say that will never happen. So from an investor psychology standpoint, I think most of the market feels that that is not going to take place. This is a political question that you're asking. I, I can't answer it, but 
we really hope that that does not happen. We do think that there needs to be more affordable housing, and that could be done through other ways, such as expanding the 421A program or the new Affordable New York program, which provides for a 35-year tax abatement. Um, so there are other ways to do it, but hopefully New York doesn't fall under that universal rent control uh, that you're talking about. But as for other states, I mean, we could, you know, we could spend the next hour answering that question. Great question. It goes back to what, it goes back to what you said five seconds ago, which is that the right way to do this is to, is to have the public and private work, sector work together to create affordable housing. The wrong way to do it is to say you can only charge this much money for your apartment because then you won't build it. Right. It's you almost like everybody to... failed basic microeconomics somewhere along right. the way. Right. I mean, I mean, look at like the, the thing that's the thing that, that's a little bit scary. You know, it, it's obviously true that investors do say that. But like for every investor that says I'm, I'm afraid of this, the other investors say it's never going to happen. So a couple of years ago, some very right. you know in, in, in incredible disruption to the multifamily market in the city did take place right yep. in, in the city and state. And so, you know, I guess we hope they don't make, don't make another wrong decision. Um, in thinking about the viability of markets across the U.S., is climate at all a factor for your investors? For example, you know, it's been like over 100 degrees in Dallas and Austin for the entire summer. Uh, that's a week. <laughs> We've always had our 100 degree weeks here. But, um, you know, or like Lake Mead drying up, fights over water, a lack of policy directives to address any of these concerns i mean at some point do you think like certain markets like in austin people might be reluctant to move to because of climate change um and things of that nature i have not seen that um we're selling we're tasked with selling you know everything all asset classes around the country what we have found is that most investors want to be in better weather states there's a great argument to be made for a place like San Jose that has maybe the third best climate around the country. You're proximate to three local airports between Oakland, <coughs> San Fran, uh, bless you, and San Jose. Um, but the weather is so good, so much better than a place like San Francisco. So uh, we definitely have found that investors want to be in better climate. What that means is different for each investor, but um, Chicago and St. Paul, Minnesota, like those are tough places to... <laughs> To, to live and, and invest. <laughs> Andrew, your debt funds have any issues with ESG or is that a big topic for investment? It is actually. Um, you know, a, a number of our investors are asking us. It's always been a big focus, obviously, for the equity side. But even on the debt side, we have investors saying, OK, we want to understand what you are doing. And so, you know, we now within our loans, we have ESG checklists that our borrowers have to fill out. And, and I'm really focusing on environmental because we've always done the social and governance with our borrowers. So this is really a renewed focus on environmental and on, you know, investors want to know that we're not lending on buildings, you know, that have tenants that are bad environmental tenants and so that's a focus and we're very focused on you know lead certified buildings um it's particularly prevalent in europe i feel like europe is 10 years ahead of us on that but it, it's coming here too so yeah we within the past couple of years have started to really focus on esg of our borrowers and the buildings we're lending on so, you know I, I i think 20 years ago no one cared at all you know i'm making i'm picking a date in time and and um, today it's today it's a topic that is discussed all the time. I kind of feel like it's like like it's not the 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 um, the discussions are not really mature enough where there's actual impact being made. Frankly, I mean we do things because investors are requiring us to be thinking about it. Um, I mean that that's that's the truth. And and, and I, I shouldn't say that way. The, a, a big part of what's happening is being pushed from 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 all angles. But I. In, in my mind, you're just starting to see the beginning of, of um, a, a cohesive approach to, to, to that question and all the questions that, that surround that question. But it's still a little bit disjointed right now, I would say. Thank you. We'll take one more question in the audience and then go to online. Um, this is kind of simple, um, or maybe not so. Uh, just how has the capital stack changed over the past six months? And you know, where are you seeing it change the most? So what we're seeing over the past six months is that the most senior lenders 
are widening their prices significantly, and a lot of them are just on hold. The debt funds like ourselves, you know, we have a constant cost of capital. So yeah, we want higher returns because there's better opportunity now, but the debt funds haven't moved as much. The senior lenders, the banks are really um, on pause. And if they are doing deals, they're doing them at much wider spread. So that's an impact on the capital right. stacks. Are the most significant part of moving the capital stack is the senior side of the capital stack is, is very illiquid and very volatile and very, um, you know, it, it's impossible to figure out where, where you can get prices. So it's making it hard. That, that's a big reason why you're hearing about transactions slowing down. And are you seeing a, you know, either MES or PREF make a bigger part in these transactions moving forward or? I don't, I don't feel like that's happening. I feel like all of us are having the conversations that we can't wait and, until the need for that, for that. I mean, it was actually going to talk about that a little bit. We didn't have time. But, you know, there, there, there's hundred million dollar loans that, you know, unless things, you know, you know, change dramatically to the, to the positive side in the next six months, are going to be $80 million loans in the future. And, and we all believe there's going to be opportunities to, to invest capital there. Um, but I, I don't, I personally think that the whole, you know, MES pref solution to the, to the, to the problems we're having now is, isn't, has not really started to, to, to rear its head yet. Got it. And I guess this is similar, but mostly for Adam here. Um, to what extent are people willing to take on negative leverage for core deals? Good question. Um, it, better, the, it better be a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so more so in the shorter duration leases, right? So we're seeing that in multifamily, um, obviously because of the trade outs that we talked about earlier. So there are certain instances that negative leverage are coming is coming into play. Um, but that almost feels like that was a few months ago. Today, those investors are saying, you know what, let's pause, see what the new world order looks like, see what financing costs are going forward, and see what corresponding cap rates are going forward. So that's multifamily, short duration industrial leases. You have seen that because, again, the lease, or the lease roles or mark to market have been such that it made sense to go in with negative leverage. But that is a little bit, you know, a little, there's just a different view today than there was a few months back. So everybody's just being a little bit more cautious. But in that period where the market was going like this and deals had to close, people took on negative leverage, but they felt that they could overcome it with the short term. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um, just one quick question, and then we'll turn it back to Tony. Uh, online, could you summarize adoption of green tech and multifamily? Maybe we'll also touch on Local 97 and others related. Local 97, that's New York more related. I didn't hear the question. Can you read that? that sounds like a very, very specific question. <laughs> could, you, could you summarize adoption of green tech in multifamily? Maybe uh, also to, adoption touch green tech? Tech? adoption of green tech. Environmentally friendly technology. It's like lead certified. What does that mean? And local 97. No, we cannot. Can go to our next <laughs> it's a little unique to New York. <laughs> Why is it coming back to me? Are we done? Wait, what's going on? Huh? Okay. Okay, I'll wrap it up with the question. Let's see. Let me pick one of these questions here. Um, okay. So, do we think that the do we think that the the actions that are being taken by the Federal Reserve now are going to be effective? I'm gonna. It's it's a multi pronged question. You can answer it any way you want. Do we think that the actions that are being taken by the Fed right now are going to be effective? I don't know what that means. Um, do we think it's going to be, is there, is there going to be a significant economic downturn? Is it going to be a soft landing? And, you know, when, when do we come out of this and start to, um, to start to grow again? You definitely want to hear what Ryan has to say. I know. I was going to let you go last. Should I go last? Yeah, yeah. you got to go last because we'll see if they're right. Because <laughs> I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> uh, if I knew the answer, I wouldn't be doing this dopey job. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I'll, but I'll try. So... <laughs> I think the Fed is throwing, you know, obviously a bunch of stimulus at the economy right now. And uh, by stimulus, I mean, obviously, they're trying to tame inflation however they can. So what I think is going to happen is I think that we're going to see the 75 or 100 basis points um, increased either tomorrow or today, whenever that whenever that vote is. And then the first part of next year, we're going to see some tempering. We're going to see rates actually come in a little bit. And we're going to see people feel a lot better about themselves and about their investing than they had been. And you're already seeing it priced into the market. So um, I think that the 10-year treasury today is around 275. It was three and a half just in June. So call it in the last you know, 75-ish days, you've seen a pullback in the treasury. 
which I think is a positive as the overall investor psychology changes. But a lot of our clients, a lot of our investors are pretty bullish, um, depending on the asset class, particularly in the multifamily space. And then, you know, then the office space will, will, will probably be last on that list. Um, but I think we're going to be in a period here that is a little bit funky over the next couple of months. But come the first of the year or the first quarter, we think that things are going to get back on track. We think the transaction volume is going to pick up again, but we don't see any sort of long term recession like we've seen in the past. I think my glib answer would be eventually yes. <laughs> the question <laughs> is just how say. long it's going to take, and then I don't know. So I would say, objectively, it's not a foregone conclusion that we're going to end up in a in a recession the way that the NBER defines it. I, I've, I, in the course of my career, I've never seen so many people convinced in advance that we are definitely headed for a recession. I'm not even just talking about it in our industry. Average people, my cousins, my neighbor's dog, everybody thinks that we're headed for a recession. I, I worry about that a little bit because it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy if everyone really believes that and adjusts their behavior accordingly. But what I would say is what this is really going to come down to is where the Fed stops. Not how fast they raise, but what's the terminal rate? Because if they're going to shoot past neutral and pull back on the reins of the economy, they can do that a little bit, and still avoid a recession. But I'm concerned that we're now dealing with an asymmetrical risk structure, that they're so focused on inflation and bringing it down, even though good academic research shows there's not a good relationship between inflation and economic growth or recessions, that they're going to overshoot and almost bring about the kind of thing that they're trying to avoid. So I would say it really depends how serious the Fed is about this. If they're just trying to brandish their inflation frightening credentials now that they're a little bit behind the curve, maybe not. But if they're really going to push 150 bips or so past most people's estimate of neutral, that seriously raises the probability. So whatever happens, you can you know blame the FOMC because they are squarely in control of this at this point. I think we're done. Yep. Well, everybody, thank you very much. For, uh, that, uh, that concludes the panel. One last note I wanted to make. We covered this quite a bit uh, through the course of the conversation. One of our next sessions will be on the topic of affordability in New York and across the country. So please come back and join us. Thank you very much. Thank you.